Good evening, and can I just say, wow. Uh, this is really humbling, and uh, it makes me think of an exchange I had with a student when I first began teaching at Baruch College in 2012. The student said to me, Professor, what kind of music do you like listening to? And I looked at the student and I said, good music. <laughs> and I think, just looking around here, I could say that it's inspiring to see week after week on a hot, humid night where it would be very easy to say, you know what, I'm going to sit in the air conditioning to see the room packed to capacity, I think is a testament to the fact that the folks in this room like good music. And that's what it, yeah, please. So thank you for joining me this evening. Thank you for joining me in the past programs. Thank you to the Darien Library, to Pat, to Mallory, to Sheba, to the staff that makes this uh, sort of community event possible. And it's very special. I think we can all testify to the fact that there's a difference between listening to great music on your own, say in the inner sanctum of your own private dwelling or wherever it is with headphones or in a meditative environment, it's a little bit different from what we do here. What we do here can't be easily replicated and every opportunity to do so is very special. So once again, thank you to the library for making this happen. And speaking of thank you to the library, I've got good news. Uh, though tonight is going to be a, a bittersweet program in some ways as we'll be wrapping up our discussion of Beethoven, we'll be reconvening in November, and the topic of that program series is going to be music and faith. And we'll be doing this in anticipation, of course, of the holiday season, but we won't be listening to Frosty the Snowman. Um, <laughs> we'll be looking instead at music over a, a diachronic span, starting with the Renaissance, with the works of the great Renaissance motet and mass composers, people whose names you might recognize, names like Josquin, names like William Byrd, names like, for example, Giovanni Pierluigi da Palestrina. These names might be completely unknown to you uh, right now, but I would surmise that many, perhaps quite a few of you, will be coming away from uh, those programs and that introduction to that music with sort of a sense of, of uh, exposure to something new and something that maybe, perhaps, will speak to many of you. I'm, I'm hopeful it will, and I'm certain that uh, it will connect with, with at least a few. We'll then be looking at music by Johann Sebastian Bach, specifically his music written for the um, Good Friday services, the Passion Oratorios. We'll be looking at Masses by Mozart. We'll be looking at Beethoven's Misa Solemnis, a piece I'm going to mention today, but we won't have time to discuss. And um, then we'll wrap up uh, in our last program by looking at music from the 20th century, including works by a man who would have turned 100 this month, actually. August, he was born in Lawrence, Massachusetts in 1918. His name, of course, was Leonard Bernstein. So uh, we'll talk about Leonard Bernstein today because I think his legacy is intertwined with the history of the Ninth Symphony, one of the most famous, iconic, and celebrated performances of the Ninth Symphony, of course, took place in December. Actually, I believe it was on Christmas Day, 1989, and it took place in Germany, in Berlin, right after the wall came down. And of course, what did they perform? What piece would you put on a program meant to celebrate the end of this traumatic period and celebrating one of the most, one of the most emotional moments in the lives of many who lived through that period? Well, of course, it was Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, and it featured musicians from the London Philharmonic Orchestra, the New York Philharmonic Orchestra. It featured uh, musicians from Russia, from Germany, of course. And uh, in many ways, I think it kind of crystallized and, and came to symbolize everything that this music is capable of doing to listeners. And we're going to listen to this music and we'll think of it, analyze it through that context, through that prism. Before we get to the music, I want to talk a bit about Beethoven at the end of his life and then say a few words about his legacy, which we'll, of course, revisit at the end of the program. The last years of Beethoven's life 
could not have been easy ones. In fact, I'm pretty sure that in many ways they were miserable for him because, you see, he was very sick. People often talk about the deafness, right? And, of course, deafness, we know, was terribly frustrating for Beethoven. And I think everybody here can relate to that. We've all been on the phone, and you can't hear the person on the other line, and you, your blood pressure starts to elevate as you get frustrated, and they get frustrated. Now, imagine that being present, that frustration being present, and exacerbating day after day, every morning you get up, and it's worse, until finally it's gone. And as we said last week, by 1818, Beethoven, who is not yet 50 years old, is now communicating uh, through these books, which we call the conversation books. And they're a wonderful resource to musicologists and historians because they tell us so much about his life. What they don't tell us, because Beethoven was very stoic when it came to his own suffering, but what we know about because of testimonials from people who bore witness to it, Beethoven was suffering from terrible, terrible physical maladies. Uh, most significantly, I would say, would be, we don't know exactly what it was, but we have some idea what might have caused it, was that he had terrible, what we'll call gastrointestinal problems. Beethoven, at the end of his life, was suffering from edema that was so bad that when the physicians of the day would puncture his abdomen to drain the fluid, they estimate that gallons, plural, of fluid were drained every few months at the end of his life. Now, I don't mean to horrify anyone with this, this uh, what is essentially very disturbing imagery, isn't it? But in a way, it's important to know about all that suffering, isn't it? Because what does it tell us? What does it say about music like the Ninth Symphony, or like the late string quartets, or the Misa Solemnis? It tells us that this is a guy who has more of a reason than ever to throw in the towel, call it quits, hang up his boots, ride into the sunset, capitulate to destiny and the way that it had dealt him this very cruel hand. And of course, when we listen to this music and think it was written by a guy who, of course, not only was deaf, and we've spoken about that and just how impressive it is that a deaf man could compose any music, let alone music that continues to inspire nearly two centuries later, but that he's writing music of such elevated quality, first-tier music by just about any conventional standard of assessment. That doesn't mean that everybody back then understood it and saw it as that, right? As we know, even something as celebrated as the Ninth Symphony finale confused the heck out of many people who were in the Kärtner Theater in Vienna. People who heard it weren't quite sure what to make of it. Now, that could have been for any number of reasons. First and foremost is the presence of the chorus. There's people singing in the symphony. Well, wait a second. Since when are you allowed to have singers in a symphony? Mozart doesn't do that. Haydn wrote 106 symphonies, 104 in the catalog, and probably two others that are not in the Hoboken catalog, 106 symphonies, zero choruses. Mozart, 41 symphonies, zero choruses. Any number of B-League composers who wrote symphonies in this period, zero choral movements. And all of a sudden, there's a chorus in Beethoven's Ninth Symphony in the spring of 1824. So that must have confused them. I think, as with so much of Beethoven's music, as we've seen, when we looked at the Appassionata Sonata, or the third movement of the Moonlight Sonata, we talked about the Eroica Symphony, and we said that if you had to choose maybe one adjective to describe a lot of Beethoven's music, and there's many adjectives we could choose, but I think on a practical level, we could say it's difficult. It's hard to play this stuff. Very difficult to pull off. And as such, I think maybe that contributed to what we might think of as an unpolished performance at its premiere, at its debut, and that might have also vexed listeners. Of course, all of these details are interesting, but they're really irrelevant to a modern audience because now musicians are capable. They've got the tools to play Beethoven, even though it does present formidable challenges. Now, when Beethoven died in 1827, it was March of 1827, there's some 
debate in the scholarship as to what his last words were. We want to have imagined that he said something inspiring, right, on his deathbed as he was dying. Really what is probably the most likely thing he said when he died is he received a shipment of wine. And he said, he looked at the wine and said, pity, it's too late. And those were the last words. Another anecdote has his last words being, applaud, my friends. The comedy is over. So again, this sort of modest, self-deprecating uh, personality emerges. But uh, I, I like the wine anecdote better. I think that's, that's probably, uh, probably the last things he said is lamenting the fact that he was no longer well enough to enjoy this wine that had arrived. When he died, his body was laid out. People came to pay homage and to pay their respects. And one person who came was a student of a friend of Beethoven's. This student's name, he was a 15-year-old boy. His name was Ferdinand Hiller. Hiller wound up being a prominent musician in 19th century Germany. He lived in the Cologne area. And he did something that many people did back then when mementos of the deceased were, you couldn't have, a, obviously there were no pictures, and if you wanted to commission a portrait or something like that, it'd be very expensive. So how would you memorialize someone? Well, seems a little bit uncouth by today's standards, but you took a pair of scissors, and you went up to the corpse, and you snipped some hair. Now that may not seem relevant, relevant to the story, but it will be, as we'll see, because this guy, Ferdinand Hiller, who by the way was from a Jewish family, that's gonna be significant, in the story, went back to Cologne, grew up, and became a very important figure in the Cologne musical hierarchy. He became a conductor. He was a prolific composer. He was known to the great composers of Europe. For example, Robert Schumann dedicated his piano concerto to Hiller. Um, Ferdinand Hiller was his name, H-I-L-L-E-R. Well, Hiller would convert to Protestantism. That was very common in those days, and his Children would grow up in West Germany and their children. In 1913, this locket which Hiller had bequeathed unto his kids, the locket which contained approximately 578 strands of Beethoven's hair. So we're talking now almost a century later. It still exists and it's in a locket. The locket was resealed in 1913. We know that because it was dated by the person who did the work, the glazier who did the work. and it wound up in the hands of Hiller's great-grandchild, who, remember, is living in West Germany. And this would be, by the time he's an adult, it's now the 1930s. And we know what happened in the 1930s. In January of 1933, Adolf Hitler became chancellor of Germany. And those were dark days. Now, you might say, well, wasn't the Hiller family descendants, weren't they sort of safe? Hadn't they converted generations back? Well, of course, the Nazis didn't care about that. In their sense of racial pseudoscience, blood purity was very important. And so it was not uncommon for them to go back and check records and so on and so forth to determine who had Jewish blood and would therefore be considered an Untermensch, subhuman. And so as they began rounding up Jews in close to 1940, the descendant of Ferdinand Hiller, who, remember, has this locket of Beethoven's 578 hair strands in his possession, flees the country. He was an actor, by the way, who in the mid-30s was banned from acting and had scraped by however he could until it was time to flee. He wound up going, of all places, north, and he went to Denmark to a fishing village called Gilalea. And there, with about 600 other Jews, he was hiding in various parts of the town. Most of them were hiding in the church loft of the town. Well, when the Nazis went and invaded Denmark, occupied Denmark essentially in 1941, this descendant of Hiller was hiding in the church loft. It turned out that one of the local barmaids knew about the fact that Jews were being hidden in this town and in this church loft. She betrays this information to the Gestapo who come and arrest those 600 Jews and deport them to Theresienstadt in what's now the Czech Republic or Czechia. What happened to the locket? Well, we don't know exactly, but somehow this locket found its way into the possession of the town doctor. 
we think that as this descendant of Ferdinand Hiller was being deported, he took the locket. Now imagine how precious this must have been to him is as he's fleeing the country, this is one of the things he takes with him. Knowing he's going to be deported to a concentration camp or some Arbeitslager, a work camp, he presses the locket into the hands of the town doctor just before he and the rest of the Jews are rounded up and deported by the Gestapo. It winds up in his hands. He winds up adopting a French orphan after the war. She winds up raising her own kids. And in 1994, they convince her, she's elderly at this point, what are you doing with this locket? We might as well offer it up to the world. Maybe it would be better served if it were put on auction. So she puts it on Sotheby's auction, and the locket, which contains 578, that's right, 578 of Beethoven's hair strands, is bought by actually a group of people in, in uh, at, of all places, United States. And the, the lead person in this auction is a guy named Ira Brilliant, a real estate developer out of Arizona. Ira Brilliant founds an institution which still exists today over in San Jose. It's the Ira Brilliant Center for Beethoven Study. And using X-ray spectrometry and whatever other techniques a forensic scientist would use, they analyze Beethoven's hair. And they found that of the strands they tested, against the control subject, Beethoven's hair had 42 times the concentration of a particular chemical element with the symbol PB, lead. Beethoven suffered from lead poisoning. And not, this was not a something, there was a theory that came up in 2012 when the scholarship challenged this idea. They said, well, wait a minute. Maybe he didn't suffer from it lifelong. Maybe it was some treatment that was administered to him at the end of his life. But that theory has since been debunked, and we now think that Beethoven was exposed to lead over a long period, primarily, probably, from the wine he drank, which was fortified with lead acetate. Beethoven, it should be said, was a drinker. Whether or not he was an alcoholic is up for debate because we don't really know what the standards of the day were, right? But if we go back to the Middle Ages, people drank an awful lot because when the sun went down, there wasn't much to do. And in the winter, people were, they, if you were a serf farming the land and the sun goes down at 5 p.m., there's not much to do. People drank an awful lot back then. So it's difficult to assess whether Be or not Beethoven was an alcoholic. I think it's fair to say that he drank a lot. Um, and again, if you're drinking wine fortified with, with essentially lead sugar, then it stands to reason it's going to compromise your immune system. It's probably not what made him deaf, although again, it fits with all the other symptoms we described earlier. The terrible gastrointestinal problems, the terrible headaches, terrible nausea. So this sheds some light, and it's, and it's really a remarkable story, by the way, the story of Beethoven's hair. In fact, there's a book that was... Um, written around 2000, I believe it was published. I bet the library probably has a copy or two of it. It's called Beethoven's Hair. It's by Russell Martin. Strongly recommend anybody who, who uh, wants to read a great sort of adventure novel that is centered around Beethoven's hair that takes us through a very dark chapter of history, some very inspiring chapters of history, and, uh, and winds up more or less in the present day. So. Where is the hair now? It's still at the Beethoven Study Center at uh, San Jose State University. Yeah. I think about $8,000 or something like that. So if you break it down and think about how much you're paying per hair strand, you know, I know we have a few people here who are really good at math, could probably tell us it's, you know, 40 bucks a hair or something like that. Yes. Do we know what happened to the Hillers? Great question. Uh, one of them came to America and finished his career in California. Uh, that's the actor we talked about, survived Theresienstadt, survived Terezin. Um, some of them were deported to the concentration camps and presumably murdered. Their, their trail ends. So, um, yeah, it's a, it's a very sobering story and not an unfamiliar one, but not one that we typically associate with Beethoven. Um, of course, today we're going to be talking about the reception of the Ninth Symphony and the legacy of the Ninth Symphony and how it intertwines with Beethoven's legacy. Um, 
it shouldn't surprise anyone here that the Nazis loved and championed Beethoven. And that's kind of nauseating in a way, isn't it? Of course, Hitler also loved German shepherds. Um, but what did they say about, for example, the fact that Beethoven was not tall and blonde-haired and blue-eyed? He was sort of swarthy in his complexion. He looked, by some accounts, weather-beaten and freckled. And his hair was a tangled mess. Everyone knows that because in every picture of Beethoven, his hair is sort of emphasized, right? Um, well, they ignored that completely. Well, what did they say about his deafness? After all, according to Nazi racial pseudoscience, is it deafness, a sort of congenital illness or something like that? And doesn't that suggest that your blood is impure? Right? We know that the Nazis, as early as 1937, were murdering their own citizens in the involuntary euthanasia program, what was known as Aktion T4. If you had a hair lip, the Nazis would gas you. If you had cerebral palsy, the Nazis would gas. I'm not talking about Jews or gypsies or homosexuals or political enemies. I'm talking about ordinary Germans of no particular political inclination. So what would they say about someone who is deaf? Well, the Nazis, in typical hypocrisy, took an opposing stance. They said, you know what? The fact that he was deaf and still composed shows that he had the indomitable German spirit. But didn't we just say that Beethoven's Ninth Symphony was used, for example, to celebrate the fall of the Berlin Wall in late 1989, and therefore, isn't the music more associated with the tenets of, of freedom and brotherhood, togetherness, tolerance, etc.? Well, it is, of course. Anyone who looks at the poem that's framed in the last uh, part of the symphony would know that immediately. So what it tells us is that Beethoven's music has been, let's say, appropriated. Some might say hijacked at times. And we should always keep this in mind because I think it's a really interesting example of how music can be spun in different directions by people, different people to suit their own ideological agenda. Of course, if the Nazis had chosen to read Schiller's poem about Alle Menschen werden Bruder, all men become brothers, Seidum schlungen Millionen diesen Kuss der ganzen Welt. Be embraced, you millions. Take this kiss from the whole world. It's hard to imagine that if the Nazis had actually stopped to think about it, that they wouldn't have played this symphony relentlessly on April 20th, all through the war years. April 20th, of course, being Hitler's birthday. This was a big celebration that Goebbels would throw, and they would cap it off with Beethoven's Ninth, which is absolutely, utterly, completely, totally, categorically preposterous. And once again, an elegant ex example of Nazi stupidity and hypocrisy. Nonetheless, I had planned to talk about some of the music from this period, from the 1820s, from the last decade of Beethoven's life. And I'm going to talk about it, but we're really going to focus our listening and most of our analysis on the Ninth Symphony. So let me say a few things about Beethoven's work in this period. In the early 1820s, Beethoven completed one of the most ambitious works in the history of, I think, really, not just liturgical music, not just, you know, church music, not just classical or romantic music, but just in the history, Gesundheit, of music, period. And it's a piece known as the Misa Solemnis, which, of course, simply means the solemn mass. It's about an hour and a half long. It had a very bumpy road in its early performances. Performers had trouble handling it. Beethoven himself claimed that it was the greatest thing he ever wrote. And I think if you really spend time with that piece, you might agree. We won't listen to it today, but hey, as it happens, I'll be back in November. And, uh, and when we get to Beethoven's liturgical music, you know, Beethoven wrote quite a bit of liturgical music. Mass settings, for example. He wrote an oratorio called um, Christ am Ölberge, which means Christ on the Mount of Olives. So Beethoven spent time working on church music. Of course, it's not what he's best known for, but we will look at it in a few months when we reconvene. In addition to writing the Misa Solemnis, Beethoven, of course, spent a lot of time working on string quartets. Three of them were part of a commission from a Russian prince named Golitsyn. And 
those three quartets must have sparked something in Beethoven because he couldn't seem to stop writing quartets. And it's interesting to consider that at the end of his life, it's not piano sonatas. Remember, Beethoven was a great piano virtuoso. That was what he was known for for much of his life. He wasn't writing piano music for the last four years of his life. He was writing string quartet music. And that's interesting. Well, string quartet music, it doesn't have the sort of showy pageantry that we associate with a symphony or a concerto, right? But this is what dominated his thoughts in those last days. In fact, some of you may know this story. In 1825, Beethoven, who, remember, he's old, he's grumpy, he's sort of a curmudgeon. But that's nothing new. He had been a curmudgeon at age 35, apparently. Beethoven is now um, sort of in a, in a position in life where he doesn't have to travel very much. Nonetheless, he goes on a trip outside of Vienna, travels a couple of days to mineral baths. These were often prescribed for people who were intent on convalescing from a whole variety of illnesses. And he comes back, and he had stopped along the way at an inn. He was going to take a coach ride back, but he got frustrated and decided that he was just going to walk, whatever it was, six miles back to Vienna. Well, six miles, it's good cardio, as the kids would say today. But back then, it could be dangerous, especially if the weather turns. And this particular trip took place in April. The weather became very cool at night. Beethoven was ill-clad to, to make it through this kind of trek. And he came down with probably what was pneumonia. And he thought he was going to die. Turns out he had about a year and a half before he would die. Nonetheless, he recovered miraculously that summer, and he wrote the slow movement to the F major quartet. Uh, it's the Opus 132, and he writes in the score a song of thanksgiving from a grateful convalescent in German. And of course, that's one of the most beautiful movements, I think, in any string quartet. Beethoven must have been intimidated to some degree in writing string quartets, especially early in his career, because string quartet writing was the domain of his old teacher, a person we've mentioned a few times, Franz Josef Haydn. Haydn more or less pioneered the string quartet genre. And Beethoven, I think in the early days, especially the Opus 18 string quartets, you could see he's very conservative in the way he approaches it, not so in the late string quartets. The late string quartets are so wild, they're so out there, that at the end of the Opus 130 quartet, now this is the third from the fourth from the last one he would write, he decided to end it with what he called a great fugue, Grosse Fuge. Now, we're going to talk about fugues later on because it's a big part of the Ninth Symphony. But when he wrote this fugue, the publisher wrote back to him and said, what the heck am I supposed to do with this? Publish it as a standalone piece if you want, but it can't be the finale to the string quartet. It's the Gro Grosse Fuge is about 17 minutes long, and it is almost tonally incomprehensible. It's like it anticipates the chromaticism of the 20th century. It's so out there. But Beethoven thought it was the, the greatest thing he had written for the string quartet ensemble. He would publish the Grosse Fuga, the Opus 131 string quartet in C-sharp minor, which has seven movements instead of four. Four is what you're supposed to do, but Beethoven's not interested in what you're supposed to do. So he writes this, this seventh movement string quartet. The sixth movement is a heartbreaking adagio in G-sharp minor. Um, some of you, if you've seen the show Band of Brothers, there's a great scene in the, one of the episodes where, where um, the company of American troops in Germany, they're in West Germany. It's April of 1945, so the war is just about over. And they're in West Germany watching Germans sort of picking through the rubble as they're rebuilding after the, the war is all but over. And there's a string quartet of German musicians in the middle of the town square, surrounded by debris and destruction. And they're playing, and it's a string quartet, of course. And one of the members of the company, of the American company, he quips, got a cigarette dangling from his mouth, and he says, he says, you know, boy, the, you know, you got to hand it to these crowds. They sure know how to rebuild. All they need is a little bit of Mozart to get them going. And of course, Nixon, the leader of the company, comes out, emerges, Ron Livingston's character emerges, and he says, that's not Mozart. It's Beethoven. And one of the privates says, sorry, sorry, Major, what'd you say? And he says, 
Beethoven. And uh, I think that scene is really, again, one of these instances in media where they seem to choose exactly the right music to suit the mood of whatever is being depicted on screen. So it's very, very powerful use of Beethoven string quartet music in, um, in film, or in this case, in a TV series. But with all the pieces that he wrote at this point in his life, I think it's fair to say that the Ninth Symphony overshadows them all. So let's talk a little bit about it. Here we have the finale to the Ninth Symphony, about 24 minutes long in most performances. In other words, the finale, the fourth movement, could swallow up most classical era symphonies. A typical Haydn symphony is about 20 minutes long. A typical Mozart symphony, perhaps if you were to average it out, 25 minutes long. Here you have a single movement, which is 25 minutes long almost. In some ways, it might be thought of as a sort of miniature oratorio, a little cantata, a choral fantasy, all blended into one. And it's interesting from the get-go because Beethoven starts us on a chord, which is going to wake us up if you somehow dozed off during the third movement. You get a chord that sounds like this. Strings playing B-flat major. And then the left hand, low instruments playing D minor. Now you put them together and you get this. Let me... Now you can hear what makes this sound so piquant is this the grating between the A and the B flat. Of course, it's voiced differently. And it's at a presto tempo, so he moves off it quickly. Some commentators and historians have referred to this as the terror chord because it's, it creates this sense of awe and dread in the listener. Again, B flat major with D minor at the same time. So it's a, an interesting sound, and it quickly moves off it. And then something completely unanticipated happens. I'll play a little bit. of that, right? There's another chord. So once again, we see Beethoven is not shying away from the dissonance. He's embracing the dissonance and, again, right from the get-go. It's at the beginning, the onset of the movement. Typically, the onset of the movement is where you want the most stability. You want to establish your key, just as he does in the Eroica Symphony, remember? And then... That's not what he does here. Here, he starts us off with... Again, the terror chord, we'll call it, and then he quickly moves on to this weird thing where the basses and cellos and octaves are going to leap up like this. Almost like, well, Beethoven tells us what it's almost like because he writes in the score, im Charakter eines Recitatives, aber im Tempo, which means in the style of a recitative, recitative, of course, for you opera buffs will be familiar because it's a style of singing. It's a style of singing where the voice is more or less approximating speech patterns, more so than a traditional aria where you're going to be singing more floridly. And this is what, it, of course, it sounds like. And right after the basses and cellos finish their first entrance, we get that over the D that dominant ninth chord, and then something interesting happens. We pick up. <laughs> 
what happened there? Well, if you know the symphony well, outside of the finale, when you hear this, almost sounds like an orchestra warming up, doesn't it? It has that sound of an orchestra tuning, because these intervals are what we call perfect fifths, right? It's outlining this A-E perfect fifth, and it has a kind of hollow sound to it that rings out. And this is exactly how Beethoven starts the first movement. So right away, as we're listening to this finale, what we're presented with is something unprecedented. Beethoven's not alluding to the first movement. He's restating it almost note for note. Completely unprecedented. The movements of a symphony are supposed to be separate. They're not supposed to be connected. And you certainly wouldn't want to rehash old material. That's exactly what he does. And of course, what do you think is going to happen right after where I just paused? He's going to go into music from the second movement. Second movement, of course, is that scherzo. Uh, all right. And then he ends there, and then we pick up again. A little pause, and then music from the third movement. And he cuts off very abruptly. I'm going to play the first couple of minutes from the symphony. And we'll have that color graph so we can watch all these things unfolding. Notice how Beethoven's going to anticipate what will turn into the Freude melody, the joy melody. Of course, we hear it a little bit on this page when the tune does this. Do you hear that? It's just a little fragment, enough to pique our curiosity. And then, of course, right where I stopped. Interrupt. Pause. So all of this uh, is building up, of course, to the grand entrance of the theme. And when the theme is first presented to us, it's so simple. It's just unison octaves. That's it. Just like this. No harmony, no counterpoint, nothing. So everything he does, he gives us the terror chord. He gives us this recitative-like voice in the basses and cellos. And then, of course, he gives us these little snippets, these fragments from earlier mo movements, as if to conjure up the, the ghost, the specter of earlier parts of the symphony, which incidentally is in the key of D minor. Of course, where do you think we're going to end? D major. Right? We know this is one of Beethoven's most potent tools in his, in his arsenal is this transformation from minor to major. Now, any jabroni can write a piece that starts in minor and ends in major. It's how we get there that makes Beethoven's work so special. So let's go ahead and listen to this early part. If we can get the lights, thank you so much. And just like that, we've established the key of D major. Now the theme is going to be presented. You can see it in octaves, simple as can be. We call this a monophonic texture, just one sound. No harmony, no vertical sonorities accompanying, no counterpoint. It's presented as simply as possible. Then Beethoven's going to stack more and more voices in the orchestra. We've seen him do this before, right, where he makes things we saw it in the Seventh Symphony Allegretto, where he begins it very simply in the low register and builds it up. We start very simply, and then he's going to turn it into a beautiful trio, and then eventually it's going to become a huge orchestral celebration. But still, no voices for a while. <laughs> 
Well, notice, what did we just end with right there? Wasn't it the terror chord that began the piece, right? After it seems we finally reach this moment where we're going to have the Freude theme, the joy theme is developing, it's growing, it's become more and more ebullient as Beethoven has added to the different voices of the orchestra until we get this thunderous uh, rendition of the theme complete with percussion battery and everything. And then we get the terror chord. And it seems we're right back to square one. We've been climbing and climbing, trying to get out of this quagmire of despair and anxiety and whatever else you might think of it as representing, and we're right back to where we started. And we're about, what, six minutes in or so, and what haven't we heard yet? We haven't heard a voice yet. Well, the voice is going to come in now. And what's he going to sing? Because it's a baritone voice that Beethoven chooses. And the baritone is going to come in, and he's, guess what he's going to sing? His very first interval. Remember that from the very beginning, except now it's not cellos and basses playing that recitative. It's an actual singer singing an actual recitative. Recitative sounds like the word recitation, right? And therefore, it suggests something on the order of speaking. We usually say that recitative is a style of singing that approximates speech-like patterns. And what's he going to sing? What's the first words out of the baritone's mouth, the first words that the audience is presented with? They've been waiting. They probably waited, oh, I don't know, 48 minutes at this point through the symphony. They haven't heard any singing. Chorus has been, hopefully, if it's a good chorus, they're sitting there and maintaining good decorum. And they're not looking too distracted because they have absolutely nothing to do. They're audience members for the first three movements and for the first quarter of the finale. Finally, the soloist comes in, and you know what he sings? He says, Oh, Freunde, nicht diese Töne. Oh, friends, not these tones. In other words, don't play. Don't play that. We don't want D minor. Sondern, he says. Sondern is the German adversative conjunction, meaning rather or however. Lass uns angenehmere Stimmen. Let's sing something more joyful. And then he's going to start to sing the theme. He's then joined by the men's chorus. And, of course, eventually it's going to build up to more than that. Let's listen. Another pregnant silence follows. Let's take a look at the words and talk about some of them. If you had to, you were to analyze this poetry. Schiller wrote this poem in the late 18th century. Beethoven had sort of meditated, you might say, almost marinated on this poem for about 35 years. He was always sure he wanted to set it to music, was never sure exactly how to do that. Beethoven, of course, grew up in Bonn. Bonn is awfully close to France. And, of course, it was in France that the ideals of the late 18th century of the Enlightenment crystallized in the French Revolution. Beethoven believed in all this stuff about brotherhood and togetherness. It's celebrating friendship. It's celebrating husband and wife, the idea of people pairing up and spending their lives in great joy and getting to experience that together. That's really what this poetry is about. Now, it does mention God, right? Und der Cherub steht vor God. What the cherub stands before God. Well, it's not a Christian God, right? It's not a, it's not a God that maybe has anything to do with Beethoven being Catholic. Beethoven, of course, was a baptized Catholic, but I don't think that really meant much to him when looking at this poetry. He wasn't thinking in that, as you might think that Beethoven thought of the God mentioned here as a sort of transcendental deity that went beyond the boundaries of creed and, and uh, faction or anything like that. This is about, this is really essentially, if you distill it down to its essence, this is almost pagan sounding, isn't it? We enter drunk with fire with the daughter of Elysium, give us great wine, and almost bacchanalian, isn't it? Well, tells us an awful lot about Beethoven. As we said earlier, he was a man who certainly liked his wine. And, uh, and this idea of a celebration of friendship and brotherhood seems at odds with his behavior through the years, does it not? 
as we said when we looked at the Heiligenstadt Testament, we said that Beethoven is defending himself, in a way, to his critics and to posterity, saying, people who think I'm a jerk, they've got it all wrong. They don't know my secret. In other words, he's talking about his deafness there. But I think that he's showing his true colors here. He's revealing his hand to us in his choice of poetry, isn't he? That we connect this to the Heiligenstadt Testament of 22 years prior. The Beethoven that walked past you on the street when you waved to him, that's a Beethoven who was dealing with his own inner demons, right? He couldn't wave to you because if you wanted to strike up a conversation with him, he'd be unable to follow. It would just be a tremendous source of frustration. He was never able to fraternize. He was never able to enjoy the camaraderie alluded to in the poetry. And it's clear from looking at it that this is probably something he deeply, profoundly yearned for. And he couldn't experience it in his life. So the only thing he could do was to exalt this idea in music, the only way he knew how. What we get next is an interesting section where Beethoven almost turns the beat around. He's going to make you feel disoriented as to where the beat is. That's not the first time he does that, is it? Remember we talked about the uh, Eroica Symphony where we're counting one, two, three, two, one, three, two. Remember Beethoven's sense of rhythm we said was much different from, say, Mozart's. He's going to give it to the tenor. Now the baritone has had his chance, the tenor is going to take the solo here. And he's going to sing about heroism and pursuing eure Bahn, pursue your path, run to your path. In other words, embrace your destiny. Isn't this something else that resonates with Beethoven's biography? This idea of embracing one's destiny, not running from what providence has chosen for you? Remember he says in the Heiligenstadt Testament, I can't kill myself, my destiny is to write more music. So we're going to get a very brief section, and I won't pause it so we can, we can uh, immerse ourselves in a longer stretch here. We're going to hear this section, which is really in, in uh, E-flat and then going to B-flat. You'll hear the tenor at the end. He's going to go up to a high B-flat, which is more of an operatic note. We don't really hear that too much in choral singing. He'll go up to a very high note, and then the orchestra is off to the races, and they're going to play a very complex, harmonically fluid kind of scherzo, where we're in a very bright, fast triple meter. The chords are going to change and swirl, and we're going to wind up on one note. Everyone knows the Ode to Joy theme, and it's going to be the most celebrated section of the Ode to Joy theme. People know how this next section goes. But what's really brilliant, if I can editorialize for a minute, in my opinion, is how we get there. He doesn't go right into it. He gives us this breathtaking section in triple meter. Rapid fire, chords changing constantly, no sense of stability, like a roller coaster ride. And then we wind up parking on one note, F sharp, played in the horns like this. Offbeat, one. Then the chords come in. Notice, again, the juxtaposition between minor and major. He starts in major here. Then he goes to minor. And then we really get hit over the head with it in the, in the most uh, sort of brazen statement of the Freud theme. So let's listen to this. We may go a little bit past eight today, if that's all right. I hope that's okay. Another pause, and we're not done. Not even close. You can see we're just about halfway through. I think what happens in the second half is perhaps even more interesting than what happens in the first half. We're now in the key of G major. We just wound up here. And now we get the second half of the text. Well, the first half we spoke about, right? We said as these allusions to entering Elysium, about wine and love and brotherhood. What does the second half say? Well, here Beethoven's going to dial back the tempo, and he's going to give us some meditation. Uh, I, sh I should say a, a setting which is more meditational than the first setting, which is sort of 
very boisterous and very, as we just heard, has this tremendous sense of triumph, this tremendous sense of outpouring of celebration. Now we're going to get music which is more introspective. And here he's going to give us almost like what I might describe as a chorale melody, almost like a hymn. And it's on the text, Seid umschlungen Millionen diesen Kuss der ganzen Welt. Be embraced, you millions. This kiss is from the whole world. And then, as the chorus starts to meditate a little bit on this deity that's alluded to in the first half of the poetry, they start to think about, well, who is this, this God figure? Well, all it says is, Üben Sternen must ein lieber Vater wohnen. There, beyond the canopy of stars, somewhere up there, it doesn't say heaven necessarily, somewhere above the canopy of stars, there must be ein lieber Vater, a loving father dwelling there. And as they meditate on what that might mean, the chorus is going to arrive on this really weird chord. It's what we call, for you music theory fanatics out there, it's an A dominant ninth chord. So you're going to hear this. They're going to say, Uben Sternen muss er wohnen. Above the stars, he's up there. He, he lives there. He doesn't interfere with us, but he lives up there beyond the stars. I'm going to play a little bit on the piano from this section, and then we'll, we'll finally uh, we'll listen to it before we take some questions. First of all, anyone who's ever, has anybody sung this piece? Anyone in the, in the okay, so I got, I got questions for the sopranos and altos later. Um, for the lower voices, the basses especially, and baritones, this part is especially unforgiving because Beethoven's going to ask you to sing quite high, and he's also going to ask you to sing unusual intervals. So we start here. If you think about it, this is D. Now you have to jump up an octave and an additional step, what we call a ninth. You're all over the place. And again, it's really written more in a tenor range for the poor basses. There's no uh, singing it down an octave. When the other voices come in, it sounds a bit like this. Lower voices come in on again on the word Bruder, brothers. Bruder, now we get a key change and listen to how we get to this uh, shift that's going to take us into the real climax of the piece. Now the words change. Such in oben Sternen zelt. Look for him. Search for him above the canopy of stars. And we get this. Above the canopy of stars, he's up there, and we get to this tremendous, very poignant E flat chord, and then all of a sudden this chord. Once again, the mystery doesn't stop. 
And just as they're parked on that mysterious cord, and we're going to listen to this in just a moment, he does something absolutely wonderful. He gives us a double fugue. A fugue, of course, is a style associated more with Johann Sebastian Bach. It's a style of complex, interwoven, moving parts. He's now given us two sections of text. First, the Freude music, and then the Zeitumschlungen music, which, as we said, was more meditative. So what do you think he's going to do here? He's going to combine them at the same time. And he's going to put it in, in complete counterpoint. So that after we're parked on this chord, we just sort of float there, meditating on a deity dwelling above the canopy of stars. And then all of a sudden, That until we finally hear the poor sopranos. Yeah, they have to hit, they'll, they'll sing this. You'll, they're going to build up their ganzen Welt, their ganzen Welt, the whole world, the whole world, the whole world, and then you'll hear this. So they've got to hold that A when they go up here. It's a very high note in soprano repertoire, and it's going to hold that A for 12 measures. So you basically have to take a very deep breath. All right, we'll listen to this, and then we'll take some questions. So this is on the text, Zeit umschlungen Millionen, be embraced, you millions. A few words before we part for now. Of course, Beethoven was present at the premiere in 1824, and as I mentioned in an earlier program, he insisted on conducting. Well, if you're deaf, you can compose music, but you can't conduct music. And so the orchestra was given very specific instructions. Don't follow the maestro. Follow this other guy, Mikhail Umlauf, who was the real conductor. Um, what happened was that, of course, Beethoven was so absorbed in the music that he wasn't paying attention to the orchestra. And when they finished, when Umlauf gave them the final cutoff, Beethoven's still doing this. And of course, in one of the most poignant tableaus in music history, he's still conducting, and the contralto soloist has to tap him on the shoulder so he can spin around and see that the audience is, has burst into this rapturous applause. And of course, it makes for a very poignant scene, doesn't it? Beethoven had wronged a lot of people. He had been duplicitous in his dealings with publishers. He had been a terrible sort of foster father to his nephew, Carl. He had dragged his sister-in-law's name through the mud and basically ruined her life for a period of about 10 years. And yet it seems with this music that it's an offering. As the words say, diesen Kuss der ganzen Welt. An offering not to just those people who were sitting in the Kärtner Theater in Vienna in 1824, but to the whole world, not just in 1824 or 1834, but in any time, this is really, I think, one of the most majestic feathers in the cap of Western civilization. And as I said in my first program, really beyond Western civilization. This is a tune that's recognized even in places where you wouldn't necessarily expect it. And I told this story before. I'll say it again. When I was in China, my students didn't recognize Bach's Brandenburg Concerti. They didn't recognize Mozart's Jupiter Symphony. They didn't even recognize, say, Tchaikovsky's 1812 Overture, these pieces which are so embedded in the, uh, in the, the mind and the listener's ear because they're the fabric. You know, everything you, you listen to from television commercials to music that might be playing incidentally uh, in a program, you hear these sounds and they become familiar. But Beethoven's Ninth seems to transcend everything. And of course, those students in China recognized it instantly and they had their own lyrics that they could sing along in Mandarin. Um, it was sort of breathtaking to witness something like that, the transcendental nature of this music. And I think, of course, it goes back to the man. Could Beethoven in 1824 have known that what he had created there was something that would endure the way it has, that would continue to affect listeners the way it does? Probably not. Beethoven lived in an era where once you died, your music basically died with you. And of course, we know that as soon as he died, his music continued to live on. 
more so than any other composer who had ever lived. And there were some who endured quite a while. Handel's music, for example, endured great popularity in England. Mozart's music endured to some degree, thanks, I think, especially to the efforts made by his wife, Constanza, who turned out was a very savvy businesswoman. But Beethoven's music goes beyond that. And of course, when we think about where we started this program, discussing the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989, and I think it's very interesting to consider that, yes, it was a very diverse orchestra comprised of musicians from, from East and West. And yes, it took place in Berlin, a city with tremendous symbolism, good and bad. And that it was conducted by a, a Jewish conductor and composer in Leonard Bernstein, who replaced, by the way, the word Freude in that performance. Freude means joy. That's the word they keep singing over and over again. In that performance, Bernstein replaced the word and the singers instead sang the word Freiheit, freedom. And in that way, Beethoven's Ninth is many things. It tells us that this is a piece that is about joy, and it is about togetherness, and it is about unity and tolerance, and the sheer jubilation that we get from being close to one another, from sharing things with one another. And I think that's something that everybody in this room can testify to after our last four weeks together. So thank you so much for joining me. You're an incredible audience, and I have to say, I'm already uh, counting the, the weeks until we reconvene in November. We're going to have some great music uh, to listen to, some, some wonderful evenings to spend together. As the days grow shorter, we'll uh, keep things nice, warm, and toasty, and uh, stimulating as we study continue. I'm happy to stick around. I know that uh, it is a bit late, but if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to take them. Yes. Great. Yeah, I'm so glad you asked because I started um, a little page, and I want to show this to everybody. Thank you, Sammy. So if I Google uh, with, uh, when are the next dates, if you Google Dr. Gil Harrell lectures, you'll come to my Facebook page. And there it is. You don't need to be a member of Facebook to see this page, and it will, it will be uh, something that you can, uh, you can just say not now. And you can see, yes, Gil Harrell Lectures. So just my name plus lectures, and you'll have uh, all the dates. So for example, you can see there's a post here about, well, there it is, the Darien Library. And if you click here, it will take you over to the page, and it will tell you exactly when and where. So all that information will be available if anybody's curious, wants to follow me around Fairfield County. Uh, you can check it out and uh, you can you feel free to send me messages. If you want to get in touch, you know my contact info is there. Um, feel free to get in touch and you can see, you know, I'll, there's always going to be material there. I'll link old lectures. There's going to be links to uh, lectures all over the place. So. You know, here's a lecture I gave on Monday. Some of you were there on jazz at the Stamford Ferguson Library, Harry Bennett Branch. Here's a lecture that we had in week two of our series. So the webpage is going to be filled with content that's going to be, I think, useful and, uh, and hopefully helpful in conveying important information regarding when and where. So no, by the 1820s, they had valves. And uh, that doesn't mean that they were as elegant and could play as chromatically as they could now. But um, they did have valved instruments by the 18-teens, 1820s. Um, it should be said that Beethoven was a real pioneer in using brass. He's the first composer, for example, to use trombones in a symphony. Symphony Number no. 5 is the first one, and we hear it in that scherzo when they're blaring away on. That's all um, you know, led by a very strong trombone chorus. Great question. So go back to last week, the 32nd Piano Concerto. Piano, uh, pi uh, piano sonata, excuse me. Sonatas are supposed to have three movements. This one has two. Is there a reason why? What we know is that Beethoven, despite the fact that he was roundly criticized by contemporaries for it, was, let's say, profoundly altering the typical forms that you encounter. Whether it's a seven-movement string quartet or a two-movement piano sonata, he's defying the norm. And um, as to why, I think he would have given an answer like this. We could go back in a time machine and ask him, he probably would have said something like, because that's what the music called for, or that's, what, that's how it sounded in my head. 
Good example is when he was asked why he put voices in the Ninth Symphony, he said, I needed the voices to say what the instruments couldn't. It's sort of an elegant response, right? He didn't actually write the words. The words came from a guy named Friedrich Schiller. Um, but, but Beethoven knew this poem for a long time, and he had sort of stewed on it and thought, how can I set this to music? And he wasn't quite sure. It took him uh, till you know, he was 54 years old and, uh, and completely deaf until he figured out a good way to do it. But of course, we get this. Yes, ma'am. Good question. When Beethoven became deaf, did he continue to speak to people? Past 1820, hardly at all. Past 1820, he was so profoundly deaf, he preferred to converse through the conversation books. So there were two ways he had. First was the, the actual books, which were sort of exactly what they sound like. He also had a slate, which he could quickly write something in chalk and erase. But um, he didn't speak much after 1820. Occasionally, he would yell at people. And I think I said in an earlier program that his voice became very sort of thick in the way that people who are hard of hearing often develop a sort of thickness in, in their delivery. But um, he preferred to converse through written medium rather than through speaking. Yeah, great question. Wem der auf der Wurm gelungen? Wurf gelungen, eines Freundes, Freund zu sein. Kuss gab sie reden, geprüft im Tod. I am not sure if it refers to Eden or something like that or some. It, there's all this reference to Elysium. It's one of the stranger lyrics in the whole thing. So I don't have a great answer for you. That's a good question. Great question. So the question is uh, about performances. This is a, may not seem like a big deal, but it really is in the, in the connoisseur community. Um, musicians and music aficionados often talk about which, not which piece they like necessarily, but which performance of a given piece they like. Um, you mentioned John Elliott Gardner. Gardner's great. I think of John Elliott Gardner. I think of the English Baroque soloist in the Monteverdi Choir. For me, I like John Elliott Gardner's Baroque recordings. I don't think of him as being a great Beethoven interpreter, although, of course, you know, that, that's because I think his Bach work overshadows it. Um, Daniel Barenboim, whom we, we listened to a little bit this week, I think, both for the piano sonatas uh, and also, of course, for his conducting of the symphonies, especially his work with the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. Those recordings are terrific. Uh, for solo piano work, Richard Good, one of the pianists that I grew up listening to, Mitsuko Uchida, who's thought of more as a Mozart performer, um, but actually did did great work with Beethoven sonatas. Uh, Marta Argerich, also not thought of as a strictly a Beethoven person, but did great work recording that stuff. Sviatoslav Richter, maybe one of the you know top three, and then uh, another person who I associate with the Baroque. But of all the composers that he interpreted, I think the top two were Bach and Beethoven, and his name, of course, the Canadian pianist. Glenn Gould. So Gould's Beethoven uh, records are interesting because his tempi, that is to say his tempos, tempi, are, uh, are controversial. You either like them or you don't like them. Gould had particular tempos in his head, but one thing I think you could say about Gould is that his articulation is second to none. And what that comes down to is how he separates the different notes of the piano and how he makes each register sound very clear. That comes through especially in, for example, the Hammer Clavier Sonata. Sonata, I think it's number 28 in B flat major. Um, so those are some of my, my answers. Yeah, Bernstein, of course. We mentioned Leonard Bernstein, a great, great uh, interpretation of the symphonies. Those are classic. Toscanini was a great champion of Beethoven's works in an era where he was sort of thumbing his nose at, at the Germans. Um, Toscanini, of course, first half of the 20th century, and by the 1940s, he was, I think, making a statement against fascism using Beethoven's music uh, to do so. Even though he was Italian, he was really rooted in, uh, in this part of the world. Alfred Brendel, can't go wrong. Can't go wrong. I mean, these are, it's like saying, you know, would you like the prime rib or the, you know, the filet mignon? You know, it's, it's all, it's, it's great stuff. Yeah, yes. Uh, great, great point. Um, with Mozart, we often frame the study of Mozart through the study of the phenomenon of genius. I haven't really emphasized that uh, in these lectures. Of course, in the Romantic period, which is really here, 1820 and beyond, Beethoven was unequivocally thought of as a genius. But I want to emphasize it's a different kind of genius. In the 18th century, to qualify as a genius, you had to do things effortlessly. If you could compose like a some kind of machine-like dynamo, and the music just flies through your head, and it comes right off your fingertips and onto the page, and you create music effortlessly, practically while you're playing games. You know, Mozart, the 
Kegelstadt Trio was written while he was playing bowling. Apparently, the, the tune came into his head. Um, Mozart loved to compose in the billiards room. This idea of being so carefree while you compose, that's a very classical era perception of genius. In Beethoven's day, to be a genius, thanks to Beethoven, the way the next generations would perceive and define genius, you had to struggle. You had to be facing some insurmountable uphill battle. You had to be deaf or you had to be sick. You had to be dying of syphilis or tuberculosis. And of course, look at the 19th century. Schubert died at 31 of tuberculosis, of syphilis, excuse me. He was a pallbearer at Beethoven's funeral and a year later he was in the ground right next to him. Um, Chopin died coughing up chunks of lung. Sorry, there's another gross. Uh, but it's true, if you had what they called consumption in the, 18, in the 1840s, it was a death sentence and a very gruesome one. So the Romantics perceived suffering as being interwoven with genius. Therefore, Beethoven is a kind of genius, but a different type of genius than Mozart. Mozart we think of as being very fraternal, carousing at the tavern and drinking and singing and having fun with singers and actors. Beethoven's alone in his dark room with the curtains drawn and it's a mess and there's papers everywhere and there's a chamber pot in the corner that hasn't been emptied in a while. And that's, that's how they perceive genius. You had to shut yourself away. You had to be isolated and secluded and almost, almost uh, in, a, in a kind of meditative environment. And, and composing is not easy. Beethoven scratched out and crumpled up and tossed and gutted out of the trash and, and uh, you know, smoothed it out and said, well, what did I do here? Maybe I can rewrite this. Um, great examples would be his opera, Fidelio. It was a 15-year struggle for him. Uh, the Grosse Fuga, which I mentioned at the beginning of the program, was a great struggle for him, how to realize and execute these ideas which were in his head. So a type of genius, but an altogether different type of genius than Mozart. Um, it's a big, good question. Yes, that's a good question. What defines genius today? Uh, oh, that could be... Yes, that's right. <laughs> that's a good one, Larry. Mark, yeah. Yeah, uh, well, there's a couple of them here today, so maybe they could tell you. When I teach, uh, for example, college freshmen, uh, is my delivery, my teaching style different? Um, I would like to say that fundamentally, no. Uh, I like to teach from the piano. I like to teach with lots of oral examples that reinforce principles that are being discussed. Music is an abstract field to study, right? You could look at a painting from 1830 and you know that you're looking at a cabin in the woods or a mountaintop or a graveyard as in the works of Kaspar David Friedrich. You know this. When you listen to a symphony from the 1830s, what on earth are you supposed to say about it? It's very difficult to describe music. It's very difficult to discuss it. So many times I remember going to concerts as an undergraduate and leaving the concert hall and I would say to a friend or a colleague or whomever, I would say, well, what did you think of the music? And they would say either I liked it or I didn't like it. And I remember feeling the sense of frustration as an 18-year-old because I thought, well, what, what can I say about it? Usually it comes down to, I like it. Why do you like it? It sounds nice. Why does it sound nice? You see, and this is sort of my approach is to go into the why of how music appeals to us and how it occurs to us and how we process it. And fundamentally, that's not going to be too different in a college classroom. I would dare say that here, Maybe I'm dialing it up a notch or two. Uh, and that's because, you know, there's an enthusiastic audience here. The difference between here, I think, in a college classroom, there's many. But one of the main differences is that in a college classroom, the students are there because they mostly have to be. Right, Jake? They, they need that credit. Um, here, people are here because they want to be. And I think, you know, that gets back to what we said at the beginning of the program um, and about this whole sort of the symbolic importance of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, that when we listen to something together, when we are, you know, Zeitumschlungen, when we're embracing one another, uh, something very special happens. And uh, that's going to be a little bit different in a classroom where there are, say, some very enthusiastic students and some very apathetic ones sometimes. Um, so for, I, I think that answers the question. It's a good question. Yes, sir. Great question. Uh, how is this music perceived in America? Well, with tremendous enthusiasm, with some exceptions. For example, 1914. Well, when you get to 1917, 
and sort of World War I has reached its apogee in terms of the hostility between America and Germany. There was a ban in American orchestras on German music. They didn't play Beethoven. Um, so with some exceptions, I would say very warmly. And um, you know, those, those examples of when a certain ethnicity or nationality of music is banned, it strikes us today as preposterous, but it happened, I wouldn't say quite a bit, but it happened often enough for it to be significant in the 20th century. In China, for example, Chinese orchestras played a lot of Western music until Chairman Mao came along and in the 1960s or late 50s, I think, said, you know what? No more Western music and all those professors with their soft hands or we're going to send them out to the farms to churn butter and callous their hands up. Um, no more Beethoven, no more Mozart, no more Brahms, no Mendelssohn. Uh, of course, in Germany, they banned any composer who had Jewish heritage, so Mendelssohn was banned. So this idea of banning composers, uh, you know, there's unique periods. It didn't happen often in America, but of course, again, at the apogee of hostilities between America and Germany, I believe it was in 1917, the BSO members complained to Kuzovetsky. They said, well, we don't, we don't have, like, we're, we cut out half of the repertoire uh, in the canon, more than half of it uh, is cut out because of this ban. So uh, with that exception, I would say that Beethoven's music has always been uh, received very warmly, enthusiastically by American audiences, including everyone in here tonight, I think. So on that note, thanks again, everybody. <laughs>